The fifth, I think it's quite interesting, it has not been published yet. It's an idea I had about Parkinson disease. I knew seven men with Parkinson disease and one woman. In each case, the spouse was a high volume talker, a world-class talker, compulsive talker, and the husband was rather more sedate and his talk time was far, far significantly less than his spouse. In the case where the woman had Parkinson's disease, the husband was a torrential talker and the wife very sedate and very nice. In all cases, the men who had Parkinson's disease were very bright and the women who had Parkinson's disease were also very bright. They were all professionals, but they were quiet, more introspective, um, withdrawn, a little bit withdrawn perhaps, but the women were talking a blue streak, always. So I thought, since Parkinson's disease has idiopathic causative implications, that means that no one really knows what causes it. And so I started to research Parkinson's disease and decided to make a little theory. The theory is this, that one's vocal vibration is related to what the body cavities need for normal equilibrium. If the body cavity gets far less than what it needs with respect to vibration, then the inner vibration will be extruded and have an external vibration compensatory act taking place. So rather than having internal vibration in the body cavities, we have hand tremors that starts Parkinson's. And in addition to that, dopamine is reduced, continually reduced in quantity until cells die and the person eventually can't even move. So I decided that in the male, hormonally, hormonally determined, we have the male's uh, baritone vibrato needing to be experienced by the body cavity but not experienced enough in these quiet men and in this quiet woman whose female hormonal effects are the same, but not with the baritone quality in the voice. And I wrote a chapter indicating, and I brought to bear a lot of data showing that the issue of vibration is now being uh, looked at by other authors. Not only that, but the Silverman method in the Parkinson's disease study is about amplitude and loudness Decibel, high decibel levels, but I think it's wrong. High decibel levels are being reported to correct tics, oral, fa oral, oral facial tics, but not, re not reducing Parkinson's. I've also brought to bear the idea that neurotransmitter effects, including dopamine situations, can really be affected by sound. And so it seems to be pretty likely that Patients with Parkinson's should read aloud to themselves each day many times, 20 minutes at a time, and also hum songs to themselves. And I have no data to back up what that would prove, but I think, it will, I think it's possible that it could reduce tremors and increase dopamine production. That all remains to be seen, and I reserve the right to be wrong about it. Um, then, final, then I did a book on this, uh, called The Discovery of God, A Psychoevolutionary Perspective, in which I point out, briefly speaking right now, that what's, what's genetic in our, in our beings is not, there's no gene for God, but there is a gene for security and a need for peace of mind, fairness, and protection. From that, we get at a certain point in phylogenetic development the animal's tail. And the tail is used for various kinds of functions, including as the eye behind the head. So when the animal wags its tail, it's for various purposes, but it's also to make sure there's nothing behind it, because we all live in a predatory world. Eventually, when tails disappeared and the cerebral cortex was developed, like as, as in 
hominids and in, and Homo sapien in people, no longer did we swish the tail to see if we get protection with the eye uh, with respect to the eye in the back. Now we have protection with the eye in the sky because we can think that we're being protected from the eye in the sky. So in a, in a homologous functional way, not structurally, but functional, we went from the tail simultaneously to group formation and then to the cerebral cortex and our need for protection. So in no way am I saying that God does not exist and no way am I saying that God does exist. I'm just saying that from a psychoevolutionary perspective, this is what happened. Okay. Finally, the seventh <coughs> contribution. <coughs> Excuse me. The seventh contribution I think I've made concerns what's known as schemas, unconscious schemas. Now, people are talking about unconscious schemas. What I did was I took the idea of unconscious schemas and said that each of us has an algorithm. And that algorithm determines everything we do and say. So that if a man needs acclamation, adoration, and acceptance from his wife or from anybody, whatever he says and does usually will be determined by that particular algorithm. If a person avoids confrontation at any cost, or collisions, avoids collisions at any cost, that will be the algorithm that determines all their lives, everything they do in their lives, speaking and acting. And I developed that idea as the seventh signal contribution that I think I've made in the literature, and that will be published in this book as well. Um, I didn't include an issue of um, narcolepsy and insomnia, narcolepsy and insomnia. I published a book in 1981 called uh, Insomnia and Narcolepsy. Uh, it, it's called Sleep Disorders, Insomnia and Narcolepsy. It was the first time a clinical book on narcolepsy was published. And in it, I decided to discuss the personality concomitants of narcolepsy that had not been done yet. And these included strong dependency needs because people, and eventually such narcoleptics become unemployable because they fall asleep all the time, or they, or they have catalepsy and they fall down, uh, or they have sleep disorders in which uh, they have uh, sleep paralysis and they have hypnagogic hallucinations. So eventually they, they can't hold a job. And they depend on other people. And this dependency becomes very imprinted in the personality. Now, when people feel disempowered, they get angry. And so I'm suggesting that narcoleptics not only are dependent, but they feel disempowered frequently and underneath are angry. And the anger also contributes to sleep. I didn't include it because um, I didn't want this book to be 600 pages, but that's another contribution that will be in the next one. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your indulgence. That's about it. <laughs>